again, electromagnetism. This is lesson three, part A, and we're going to be examining magnetic circuits. So if you're following along in the textbook, then uh, this is chapter 11, uh, part four in the textbook. So magnetic circuits. This is like an electric circuit where the voltage causes current to flow, which is opposed by resistance to the circuit. So we could create a bit of an analogy here. We're going to be talking about uh, magnemotive force, or sometimes called MMF, but the official symbol is M lower script F for magnemotive force. And this is equivalent to what we might consider voltage in Ohm's law and magnetic flux using the symbol phi to be equivalent to current again in our analogy with Ohm's law. Um, it's also the magnetic path taken by the flux so the ability to conduct that flux is important and this is related to the material's permeability or its ability to conduct the magnetic field. So the first thing we need to look at is relative permeability and we use the symbol mu. That's what the backwards Y looks like. And the subscript R to represent relative permeability. So this is an important concept. We've got to wrap our heads around this thing called permeability or being able to conduct a magnetic field. This compares permeability of a material to the permeability of air or a vacuum. So we use the symbol mu um, and it doesn't have any actual units for mu relative. It's just a standard. So mu relative is B, the substitute material, compared to the B in air. So where B is the flux density, if you remember B is in Tesla's, so flux density in Tesla's or in Weber's per meter squared. I'll just go back to that, make sure we've got that right. So the B is simply the, the uh, flux density of the material plus the flux density of that particular flux in air. That those two, the ratios together, give us the mu relative, relative to air or a vacuum in particular. So the permeability of air, we're going to use mu zero because that's the worst possible case where there's absolutely nothing possibly conducting the magnetic field. It's just driving through the air or a vacuum. So in air or a vacuum, the ratio of the flux density B and the magnetizing force H producing a flux gives a value called the permeability of air, or you might hear it termed the permeability in free space. So this value is constant regardless of the magnetizing force, and so it's called mu zero. So it never varies, it's always the same no matter where you are in the cosmos. So we can actually calculate mu zero, so it's equal to four pi times 10 to the minus seven, so it's a nice little standard constant, and it is that exactly. So there you go, there's one of those numbers that the universe is very finely tuned and balanced around. And for all practical purposes, we simply call it 1.26, times 10 to the minus 6 henrys per meter. So there is this relationship between inductance and the henrys of a magnetic field. So what's absolute permeability? Just mu by itself. So the absolute permeability mu of a material is calculated by multiplying its relative permeability by the permeability of air. So that is mu is equal to mu relative multiplied by mu absolute. 
that's what the formula is saying so no absolute permeability is sometimes referred to as just straight permeability so whenever we use the word permeability or the symbol mu by itself we mean the absolute permeability of a particular material and most of the time you're going to be given those values so what about permeability in terms of B and H so absolute permeability of a material can be calculated with this formula so permeability or absolute permeability of material can be calculated with B divided by H where B is the flux density again in Tesla's and H is the magnetizing force remember amp turns per meter so H is simply the current multiplied by the number of terms divided by the distance in meter that's what amp turns per meter means so if you gain a little hint if you're ever looking for the formula and you don't know what it is look at the units so if you want to know what the formula for H is it's the current multiplied by the number of turns divided by the distance of the magnetic path in this particular case so this equation can be transposed both in terms of B or H and it gives us B equals absolute permeability times H or we can have H is equal to B divided by absolute permeability of our particular material remember so here are some really common ones and um, I'll just turn my pen on quickly to highlight them so nickel is uh, quite good and quite often used and uh, here you can see its relative permeability between 1 to 600 and its permeability minimum is really about 1.26 times 10 to the minus 4 iron you can see you give that you know the big three ticks here because iron's got pretty high permeability so 200 to 5000 and basically 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 and then we get things like special silicon silicon with uh, iron grained orientation so it's a silicon steel that's been particularly set up to keep all the uh, molecules nicely aligned to help it be a good magnetizing material relative permeability absolutely huge up here at uh, 40,000 and uh, it's 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3 used in transformers ferrite we're not going to run into very often because it's only used in high frequency applications mostly in electronics um, permalloy again comes in various grades and is used in uh, very sophisticated transformers and mu metal um, mu metal has great uh, magnetizing properties and is used as a magnetic shield and you can see here why um, 25 times 10 to the minus 3 is its uh, absolute permeability and it's nice and light in relative terms but it's quite brittle so uh, it has some downsides in its physical characteristic so relative permeability um, mu r changes with the flux density of B and Tesla's and the values shown give an approximate range and the minimum values of permeability are given against mu which is the absolute permeability of a particular material so that being this column here that we looked at that gives you the absolute permeability of the material so nothing like a little example to uh, get our heads in the right space what is the absolute permeability of an iron core if its relative permeability is 5000 at a certain flux density so if you remember our uh, little formula for working out 
absolute permeability, it's just the relative permeability multiplied by the permeability of air. So this one's the one where the air is. And this one's the relative permeability which they have given us. So we've just got to know what the permeability of air is. We know it's 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6. So we simply multiply 5,000 times 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6. And it's going to give us the answer of 6.3 times 10 to the minus 3 henrys per metre is the unit that we use to describe that, as I said before, there's that relationship between Henry's and inductors and things that you will come across in further study, particularly as you move into AC theory. So let's look at a second example here. Calculate the magnetizing force H and the flux density in the core of a solenoid as shown here below. And they tell us we've got a 40 centimetre core uh, we've got 100 turns, the iron core is has an absolute permeability of 0 0.0011 henrys per metre and we've got a magnetising current of 1.6 amps. So we've got a whole heap of information there which we've uh, listed on the screen. So we've got the absolute permeability, we know how many turns there are, we know the current and we know that it's 40 centimetres long and don't forget we're working in metres so we just convert that quickly into metres giving us 0.4 of a metre what is the H and what is the B? well the best way to find the H is to take the number of turns and multiply it by the current if you remember H equals amp turns that's the units for H so do a very good T there, did I? So our H is simply our current multiplied by the number of turns. In this particular case, 100 times 1.6 divided by 4, giving us 400 amp turns per metre. Then finally, the, the B for the The density, the uh, in Teslas, B in Teslas, is what we're trying to get to, is equal to the um, absolute permeability for the material, which uh, they gave us, times the amp turns, of course. And there's our, our amp turns, or our H. So 0 0.001 times 40, giving us 0.44 Teslas for our flux density. So the next concept we need to think about is reluctance. And as the name implies, it's kind of analogous to resistance because how reluctant is the path to let a magnetic field pass through it? That's where the base word comes from. So a magnetic path has a resistance to a magnetic field and we refer to this as its reluctance or its reticence to conduct that. So it's like resistance in Ohm's law. So the symbol is R, subscript small m. And we measure this in ampere turns per Weber. So ampere turns divided by the number of Webers. And again, I point out there's the formula. If you want to know what the formula is, Often you don't have to remember because the units tell us the formula. So it's amp turns multiplied together divided by the Webers. So RM now in terms of Ohm's law, because we said right at the beginning there was this analogy between the two of them. So an electric circuit Ohm's law relates to volts, current and resistance. I equals V on R. In a magnetic circuit, there's a similar relationship between magnetic force, Fm, magnetic flux, phi, and reluctance, 
RM. The FM kind of representing the voltage, the flux representing the current, and the reluctance analogous to resistance. So our formula is phi equals FM on RM, where the flux density phi is in Weber's, the FM, the magnetic force, is in amp turns, and finally the RM is reluctance, and it's in amp turns per Weber. So in terms of Ohm's law, we can look at all that again. And so we have our original formula, and I've just inserted the Ohm's law equivalent here. So again, we have the Ohm's law equivalent, I equals V, the FM, and the R being the M. So that's equivalent to I equals V simply divided by R. So it's also sometimes known as Hopkins law and again it's analogous to Ohm's law with resistance replaced by reluctance voltage replaced by MMF or magnetic force and current replaced by magnetic flux. The permanence is the inverse of reluctance. So if we had reluctance is analogous to resistance, then permanence is analogous to conductance. It's SI units, are derived units, and they are the Henry. It's the same as the unit of inductance, also although the two concepts are distinct from each other and we must keep that in mind. So just like we had factors affecting resistance in DC, we've now got factors affecting RM or the reluctance of a magnetic field depends on one, the length. The longer the magnetic circuit, the higher its reluctance or its resistance to the magnetic field. Two, the cross-sectional area. The smaller the cross-sectional area, the higher the reluctance, the bigger the cross-sectional area, the less resistance. So again, exactly analogous to a resistor. And third, the permeability. The lower the permeability, the higher the reluctance. So it could be compared between the resistance of a piece of steel wire and a copper wire. Copper wire has a much better uh, conductivity or a much lower resistance. So here, the lower the permeability, the higher the reluctance and the ability to conduct a magnetic field. So RM now in terms of absolute mu and in area. So a reluctance of a magnetic circuit can be calculated and this is how we do it. So our reluctance is 1 on mu absolute multiplied by mu relative multiplied by the area. And you can see the A is on the bottom of the formula therefore it's an inverse relationship to the RM. So the RM and the A are directly reciprocal or the inverse mathematically of each other because the physics is inverse. It's not the other way around. The formula is only inverse because the physics is inverse. Or we could just call it Rm is 1 on mu A because we know that the absolute mu of a material is simply the relative mu multiplied by the mu of air. So again, getting our terms right, RM is the reluctance in amp as turns per Weber. Mu zero is the permeability of air. And if you remember, that was 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 henrys per meter. And the relative permeability of the material for which the circuit is main, made, if you know what it is. And mu is the absolute gain permeability if you know what the material is. 
A is the cross-sectional area in him. Don't forget it's in square metres. That's a trick for beginners. Quite often people forget. That's it in metre squared. So let's have a quick look on the effect of an air gap on reluctance. And here we have a circuit which is a contactor coil or something similar. And in picture A you can see it's the unenergized so the coil energized armature when the armature is open we've got high reluctance caused mostly because of the air gap but in picture B on the right hand side you can now see the magnetic field has closed the air gap the coil energized armature closes and all of a sudden we have a low reluctance so a relay has an air gap in the magnetic path and the armature is open which increases the reluctance of the magnetic circuit and you'll see us we're going to use this in our little prac and uh, demonstrate that uh, that's what happens when you uh, operate a relay you go from a high reluctance to a low reluctance and it's much easier then to keep the relay energized so again let's do a nice little worked example and again I'll just quickly turn on the pen so in this particular case, we've got the core of an electromagnet. It has an average length, L, of 350 millimetres and a cross-sectional area of 400 millimetres square. The coil has 20 turns. When a current of 2 amps is passed through the coil, we get a total flux of 100 microwebers. It's established in the core. Now we need to work out what is the reluctance RM of the core, what is the flux density of the core in Teslas, uh, determine the magnetizing force in amp turns, and calculate the relative permeability of the core. So there's all the data again, 20 turns, our average length of 350 millimeters or 35 centimeters, cross-sectional area of 400 which comes from our 20 by 20 so the first our first solution for number one 20 turns times 2 amps is going to uh, tell us our FM and we know how many Webers we have so if you remember RM is simply the FM divided by the flux. So FM is the current multiplied by the number of turns and they've given us the flux. So we simply end up with our 20 times 2 giving us 40. That's what we've got here, our 40 divided by our flux density at 100 microwebers. So it's 100 times 10 to the minus 6 giving us 400 times 10 to the minus 3 or 400,000 amp turns per Weber. So remember it was amp turns divided by Webers. So that's our unit amp term Weber. Next we had to work out what B was, the Teslas. And again that's just a nice simple formula of B divided by the phi which we were already given at 100 times 10 to the minus 6 and our area which was 400 millimeters squared but if we put that in square meters it's 400 times 10 to the minus 6 and we do the mathematics and we come out with a B of 25 micro tesla Number three, determine the magnetizing force. It's kind of like the voltage applied to the circuit. And we know that H, the magnetizing force, equals the amp turns divided by the length. So we have the amp turns at 20 times 2 amps. I'll just go back. Times 2 gives us, and then divide that by our length. If you remember, it was... 350 millimeters or 0.35 of a meter giving us 114.28 amp 
turns per meter and again there's the units for the formula in amp turns per meter so now let's go to uh, solution four which is to calculate the permeative relative sorry the permeability relative that's what I was trying to say so here we know what the RM is because we found that in step one we know the RO of air is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 and we know the area which is 400 times 10 to the minus 6 to put us into square meters so all we've got to do is take our formula for RM reorganize it a little bit make transpose the formula relative to mu relative which is the one that we're after put the data into the formula which is what we've done here and do the math and we simply have a mu relative of 496 and if you remember the mu's don't have units because they are just a relative amount of permeability compared to air so there's no units it's just 496 so here's a picture of a three-phase transformer and if you look very carefully this is an air cooled transformer and the reason I kind of got this picture for you is to show you just how big these things can get and here is thousands of turns so here we have thousands of turns and there's actually two windings so we have a external winding and an internal winding and the in external winding so this is the winding external is the primary so that's the primary and this particular transformer happens to be a 11,000 volts so it's 11 kV transformer and it's 1500 kVA kilovolt amp so it's a big transformer air cooled on the inside which you can't see so tucked away down in there but these are the buzz bars coming off it is the secondary winding so the secondary winding is down in there and you can see it's made up of this wound bar and in this case it's 415 volts and uh, the buzz bar has got to carry something in the order of probably um, close to 2000 amps so I'd have to do the calc and I can't do it in my head but something in the order of about 2000 amps so you can see the bars are quite large coming off the secondary now if you look very very closely in these gaps you'll actually see the thinly layered laminated silicon steel which makes up the magnetic core now the magnetic core sits around like this through the transformer so you have this big magnetic core that's running around the whole transformer so it's laminated so laminated silicon I can write silicon steel they use silicon steel because it has great permeability it has great strength um, it has it's nice and ductile it doesn't break easily um, 
It's mechanically strong and it has that great ability to uh, transfer lots and lots of magnetic flux. So there you go, there's a place where they actually work out the Bs, the Hs, the permeability so they know how much silicon steel they need to put in a 200, sorry, 1500 kVA transformer. So they can put uh, 11,000 volts in, get 415 volts out at somewhere around about 200 amps. So in transformer manufacture, all this stuff we're learning about magnetic fields and magnetism is very, very applicable. So let's sum up this first lesson or part A of lesson three. Absolute permeability, mu, is the ability of a material to conduct the magnetic flux and its unit is in the Henry's per meter. Permeability of a vacuum is mu O and is a constant and equals the permeability of 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 in Henry's per meter, or Henry's divided by meters. Relative permeability uses the mu subscript R and is a measure of the increase in flux density a magnetic material causes compared to air for the same magnetizing force. For a um, ferromagnetic material, uh, mu r is always greater than 1. Permeability, standard permeability of a material is a product of the permeability relative multiplied by the permeability absolute of air or a vacuum. It also equals the flux density divided by the magnetizing force. So if you remember our formula, mu equals B on H. Reluctance, we use the symbol R subscript M and is the resistance to a magnetic path, two magnetic lines of force, that is the flux, phi, and it's measured in ampere turns per Weber. And again, don't forget, the units tell us the formula, amps times turns divided by Weber's. So that brings us to the end of electromagnetism lesson three. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about relative permeability and absolute permeability of materials.